Bioshock Infinite is to Bioshock what Bioshock is to System Shock 2. Hallelujah. As I said in my essay on Bioshock 1, it has a major meta-element, in that it commentates on the tropes of its spiritual ancestors, and most specifically what may as well be its thematic prequel, System Shock 2. In Bioshock, as in most other 0451 games, you start out with an unclear goal in a fantastic world, typically contained in some way, cut off from the outside world. Whether it be Von Braun and the Rickenbacker as in System Shock 2, Black Mesa, Shadow Moses, or indeed Rapture. Something has gone wrong in that world, typically due to man's hubris. You have Liquid Snake's desire to prove that he's better than his brother, Solid, the Resonance Cascade scenario caused by man's experimentation, you have the development of the Shodan AI in System Shock and its sequel, and you have Adam in the Plasmid in Bioshock. Another trope in all of these games is for the protagonist to slowly become engulfed in the problem of the game's world. The Snarks in the Hive Hand, the Augmentations in Deus Ex, the Mechanical Eye, the Exotic Weapons, and the Transformation into a Big Daddy. Sorry to recap my last essay so early into this one, but I'd also like to quickly cover the literal events of Infinite's ending here before moving on, in case you need a refresher or an explanation, as it is pretty complicated. So, with Comstock killed, our last question is how Booker is related to Elizabeth's missing finger. Songbird destroys Elizabeth's siphon, and now has to be killed. She uses a tear to transport Booker, Songbird, and herself into Rapture, and comforts Songbird as it drowns. One thing worth noting is that we see a little sister crying to her dead big daddy in the distance, lined up with Songbird and Elizabeth, alluding to the multiverse we're about to peer across. Anyways, we get into the bathosphere and see the lighthouse from Bioshock 1, and it's revealed that we're currently in the world in between realities. There are infinite lighthouses, each one leading to a different but parallel city. It's then revealed that Booker refused a baptism after wound and knee, and that the Lutesses bought Booker's daughter, Anna, so that Comstock could have a child of his own genes, Elizabeth. In order to fix what they had started, the Lutesses wiped Booker's memories and told him to go to Columbia and rescue Elizabeth. Elizabeth tells us that Comstock is still alive in Infinite Realities, so we go back to where he was born, the place where Booker refused his baptism, and with that, it's revealed that Booker and Comstock are the same person. One got baptized and one didn't. So Booker agrees to be drowned before he ever made the decision to be baptized, and as the Elizabeths from different realities kill him, Comstock, Booker, and by extension, Anna slash Elizabeth, cease to have ever existed. Moving on, Bioshock commentates on the tropes of its ancestors to make a point about free will, and so Bioshock Infinite furthers those ideas, showing us the opposite side of the same coin, another road that leads to the same conclusion. It never matters what you choose. Bioshock says that every player character is essentially a slave, not having the ability to truly choose, and Infinite says that every real-life human is a slave, not being able to know how their choices will impact their timeline no matter how much it feels like we're choosing consciously. There's so many choices. They all lead us to the same place. Where it started. No one tells me where to go. Booker. You've already been. Which leads me to the title of this video, The Free Will Paradox. The question is, is it possible to change the future, or are we all just trapped in one timeline, unable to see the many roads ahead? And if we were able to truly choose our actions, would that be any more or less liberating than being trapped without free will? According to how I see Bioshock Infinite, its answer is no. One of the most interesting aspects of Bioshock Infinite is the fact that we're constantly presented with branching paths that all lead to the same destination. The level design is absolutely full of these forked paths that immediately lead to the same place. Then you have moments like the two pendants, the baseball, the coin, the guitar, or even something as seemingly a given as the decision between certain weapon upgrades, infusions, or vigors. Bioshock Infinite loves to give you choices. Narratively speaking, there's more choices to make than there are in Bioshock. However, Bioshock offers three separate endings, while Infinite only has one. It doesn't matter if you throw the baseball at the interracial couple, or choose the cage pendant for Elizabeth, or play guitar for the young boy. Hardly, if anything, changes with those choices, however they feel like they matter. Just as it doesn't matter if you push up the left or right flank in any of the dozens of parallel battle arenas in the game, it still feels like an impactful decision. So the game constantly presents us with choices that don't ultimately matter. Why? Well, this is where things get meta. While Bioshock 1 also fits this description, I see Infinite as a sort of swan song for the immersive sim genre. Acknowledging the redundancy of making more immersive sims in that format by exposing the format for all to see. Like Bioshock 1, Infinite is very interested in analyzing the tropes of its ancestors, and the lead characters of both games are trapped within those tropes. There's always a city. 
In this final scene, we see countless parallel universes, each one containing a lighthouse that leads to a rapture or a Columbia, with subtle differences due to being in different timelines. Along with these lighthouses, they may as well have shown the shuttles that supposedly take the player to the Rickenbacker, Citadel Station, or Talos 1, or even the tram from Half-Life. They're all just doors to those games' worlds. You're in the normal world, then you go through the door and you're in this fantastical immersive sim world. In my recent Metal Gear Solid 3 essay, I theorized that Snake realizing he's a weapon of the times and not of any ideology was Kojima's way of acknowledging that Snake only ever exists to complete a mission whether he agrees with it personally or not, essentially exposing the redundancy of continuing the series past Solid 3. We know, however broadly, what's going to happen in Metal Gear Solid games, just as we know what's going to happen in immersive sim games from this lineage. Finding a city that was torn apart by man's hubris, getting more and more absorbed by the thing that destroyed the city, being betrayed by something we trusted, be it Ryan, Fontaine, Shodan, or ourself as in Prey and Bioshock Infinite, and eventually confronting whatever it was that betrayed us. It's a formula, one that was becoming apparent by the time Infinite came out. This predictability of the broad strokes of immersive sim plotlines is one of a couple reasons for Infinite's ending. Elizabeth is able to see what happens in every single lighthouse, just as we were becoming able to see what's behind every metaphorical lighthouse. Hubris, betrayals, and a slow reveal of how closely related you are to the city. It's a pattern. To put it in literal terms, Citadel Station, Columbia, Black Mesa, Rapture, and so on exist in parallel universes. There's always a city, and a similar plotline, and everything else, as I believe Infinite is saying, is just cosmetic changes. Plasmids instead of Vigors, an AI going rogue instead of a resonance cascade, missing memories instead of manufactured ones, Columbia's sword key and scroll instead of Rapture's art, science, and industry, a bird pendant instead of a cage pendant, Booker throwing the baseball at the captives instead of at the announcer. It seems to me that Infinite is saying, change all you want about the world and its problems, there's always a city and a man in a similar plotline. We could have just as easily been the Booker DeWitt that led the Vox Populi revolution in this timeline, and it still would have been a similar plotline. So, wrapping around to where I started this section from, with the pattern exposed to Elizabeth and the player, what's the point in making more immersive sims that follow that same pattern, the system shock formula? Go left or go right, you'll still end up on the other side of the room. Following this logic that Bioshock Infinite is encouraging game creators to get out of following the system shock formula, the post credit sequence is recontextualized. Booker opens up a door to Anna's crib and says Anna, revealing that she's back in her crib, and we're back to where we started. The cycle begins again, and the game acknowledges that the System Shock formula will continue to be used. This post credit sequence may as well have been a teaser trailer for Prey 2016, a short, 5 second clip that reveals that the System Shock formula is coming back soon. Don't get me wrong, as I've said before, Prey is my favorite game of the past decade, and I'd probably choose it over any Bioshock game, but I still get the impression that Bioshock Infinite would be disappointed if it knew that it failed to finally put the System Shock formula to rest. However, as my interpretation of the post credit scene suggests, I wouldn't be surprised. I will say though that the ending is a little ambiguous. Booker became Comstock before he had Anna, so when the Elizabeths drown Booker before he decides whether or not he'll be baptized, they're retroactively changing the past, meaning there would be no Booker, Comstock, or Elizabeth. However, the fact that Booker exists at all in this post credit sequence tells me that they must not have gone back far enough. There were still infinite Bookers, and the Elizabeths only killed one of them. Interesting, but not very satisfying from a plot perspective. Thematically, however, it makes sense in tandem with my idea that the post credit sequence is acknowledging that Infinite correctly assumed that it would fail in its mission to put an end to the System Shock formula. If anyone has some logic that I've overlooked giving a different literal meaning to the post credit sequence, I'm all ears, but above is the most satisfying way of looking at it that I can see. The ending was all about going back in time and killing the System Shock cycle before it ever started. And the post credit sequence reveals that they didn't go back far enough, and that the System Shock cycle will continue past Infinite because of that mistake. To put it in slightly less abstract terms, the Elizabeths drowned System Shock just before it got baptized and became Bioshock. However, they didn't go back far enough. To truly put an end to the System Shock cycle, they needed to smother System Shock in its crib, and maybe even that wouldn't have been enough. Things get set in motion. How would one know how far back to go? Don't get me wrong, I think it would be a gaming tragedy if we never got any of the Shock games, and Infinite Story feels as fresh or even more so than Bioshock's, but this is an especially interesting way of saying that they were starting to get a bit formulaic. Anyways, Bioshock Infinite is a game of many layers, and can be read in a million different ways, so let's re-examine this ending and see how the meta-narrative described above relates to Bioshock's ideas about free will, or the lack thereof. While the two Ken Levine games, 1 and Infinite, are to me ultimately about free will in a linear game, 
Many of Infinite's ideas apply to free will in the branching narrative game, and many of both games' ideas can also be applied to free will in the real world. The major theme of both games is that our paths have already been written for us, and there's nothing we can do besides act out our part. In the world of Bioshock, humans have the ability to change the future by making decisions. Whether or not we have this ability in real life is a topic for another day, but in Bioshock we do. However, there are so, so many possibilities that rather than be made free by his ability to decide, Booker is enslaved by his decisions. First, his decision to sell Anna, resulting in him branding his hand and being recognized in Columbia. And second, his decision to not go through with the baptism, with Comstock serving as an example of what he could have been if he accepted it. In the world of Bioshock, it's impossible to predict what humans will do, and so with every decision that Booker makes, the circle of possibilities for his future gets smaller and smaller, his fate slowly being set in stone. Free will is a finite thing. For all the free will humans have in Bioshock, each decision they make just uses up a bit of it. As a microcosm of this, consider the raffle in the beginning. Before the decision to throw the baseball is made, we could have been the Booker who threw it at the couple, or the one who threw it at the announcer, or the one who didn't throw it at anybody each one with a different future, or so we're led to believe. However, as soon as you throw it, your fate is set in stone. The interracial couple is either going to thank you later or not, based on how you choose, but they won't do both. So to quote the game, what if one day you decide that you didn't like your choice? Surely somebody who had no free will, such as Jack in the beginning of Bioshock 1, wouldn't have to worry about that, because he never made a choice. To have no free will is liberating. If you know that you were always going to think and do exactly what you did, then suddenly the burdens of pressure and regret are irrelevant. So which would you prefer, to be able to choose, or to be destined to do what you were always going to? Essentially, it's a choice between pride and regret, or nothing at all. A creature with free will would feel proud of certain things, but regret of other things, while one whose fate was written in stone would have no true cause to feel either. Of course, in real life, this isn't the case. We feel enough like we have free will to feel things like regret and pride, but if the outcomes of all of our decisions could be exposed to us, would we still want that free will? Would it even still be free will?